Today's scripture reading is from Micah 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot, then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, if one feeds them, they proclaim peace. If he does not, they prepare to wage war against him. Therefore, night will come over you without visions and darkness, without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they will lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Angela, for reading God's word for us. If you are thinking, well, can it get any better than that? <laughs> Welcome to Chelton. Perhaps last couple of weeks, you might thought, whoa, that's dark. Well, one more Sunday, here we go. Uh, as a church, we have been studying the book of Micah uh, this spring with the theme of walking humbly uh, with hope. And today, I just want to catch you up where we have been to kind of set a tone for where we are going today. Uh, this letter, this book is written to the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. None of them really were doing what was right. So first week, we talked about how idolatrous desire, they took pride in whatever the desire they had. They thought, we walked through each town, how some towns names were beauty. You think your beauty is strong enough to save you and you will die by every wrinkle on your face as they will be naked and ashamed as a Syrian kingdom will conquer them. Some town took pride in their power as the name of the town meant conqueror. There will always be someone stronger. You, they will come to ruin. Whatever you took pride in yourself, it is not enough to save you. So Micah's call to us is to repent, humble yourself before mighty God. And last week, we looked at chapter two, Pastor Bill walked us through, they talked about economic oppression of the wicked. Through their greediness, they took advantage of one another. There are many things that we know when we are doing wrong, but greediness, how much is really enough for you? We are so self-absorbed and always want more and more. So Micah calls us to examine ourselves. That brings us to Micah 3, where we are today. And this week, uh, Micah is not going gentle here either. He will confront both political and the religious leaders of that day. Uh, there are so much injustices happened all over throughout the nation for their own, to meet their own fleshly desire. So we will talk about what the Bible says about justice and injustices. Now, perhaps some of you experience what justice and injustice is all about in your own life. Personally speaking, for the first time when I really experienced injustice that dramatically altered my life was when I was in third grade. 
Um, I went to an elementary school that were kind of famous for its swim team. Actually, we, had, we were a small team, only seven, eight of us, but one of my, my coll colleagues, my swim mate, I meant to say, ended up holding a Korea national record, being selected into national team. So we were like training, and because some of us were qualified for national competition, my province that year gathered all the like, national qualifiers, swimmer for like camp for a few months of training. But at the time, there were just a group of people so unruly. I mean, there are so many days that I don't want to go into all the details, but I was physically beaten up. There are many things in my life. There are times, oh yeah, I've done wrong. But there are also many times, why? Why do I have to experience this? I didn't do anything wrong. I was bullied. I can't even tell you how many times I was beaten up physically. And I tell coaches, hey, this is what's happening. They're like, oh, Jin, that's just the way it is. I felt so powerless and helpless. This is not what it's meant to be. I mean, why am I bullied like this? And I, I'm, I'm talking to the stronger ones. Hey, can you help? They're like, no, it's just the way it is. And in the end, I ended up telling my parents, I cannot do this. I was like four or five hours away. I was only third, fourth grader, but we were training for nationals. But my parents ended up pulling me out of this camp uh, because I was suffering this such a dramatic, it traumatized me for a long time in my life. Um, injustices, and I'm kept thinking, why is the world like that? I experienced it in such a young age, and it was just accepted as norm, and I'm like, no, this is not right. Perhaps some of you have been traumatized by some really difficulties in your life. Or perhaps you are seeking for the true justice that is to come. And yet we will look at today that no one is doing what is right. So let's talk about it. What does the Bible say about justice through Micah 3? Three things that we will learn in today's passage. First, the problem of justice. We will dive in how we understand justice differs from one person to another person greatly. So I'll catch you all of us up in place. And second, we will talk about what the Bible speaks about justice. And lastly, the hope for true justice. So let's go one by one. So first, the problem of justice. When we look at the book of Micah, there are, I would say, four kind of very pronounced themes in the book of Micah. First, the two are sin and judgment. We talked quite a bit about that in the last couple of weeks. We will talk about that as well. Because of your sin, impending judgment is to come. Our God is holy God who abhors sin. And as a result of our sin, this judgment is to come. He's called for us to repent. And another two themes that we will talk as we continue to go along, book of Micah, is justice and hope. And here in book of Micah, chapter 3, Micah brings us the theme of justice right in front of our faces. Now here, Micah is speaking to the political leaders. Read verse 1 and 2 and 9 and 10. What does Micah say? Then I say, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? You who hate good and love evil. Look, verse 9. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Here, Prophet Micah clearly raised the issue about justice. The leaders who should embrace justice by loving good and hating evil they do exactly opposite verse 2, right? They hate good and love evil. The lethal problem that these leaders faced is that uh, they do not know true justice. And what they know it, they despise it. Verse 9, who despise justice and distort all that is right. The question that we must ask then, what is really justice? Now, the way we understand justice in this modern culture is very different from one person to another person. And this is such a word. I mean, this book is written, as I said in first week, 740 BC to like 690 BC around that time. 
Yet the issue of justice has been all throughout the centuries and throughout, yet especially last decade or so, it became such a buzzword. And way we understand justice differs from one person to another person. So just let me catch all of us up to the same page, how this modern culture understands justice. Here, none of these are my own. I'm borrowing from ancient thinkers, Greek philosophers such as Socrates and Aristotle as well as Scottish and English philosopher Locke, Hume, Immanuel Kant, as well as German philosopher uh, Marx. I'll also borrow the modern philosophers such as Michael Sandel, as well as Christian thinkers, such as Andy Crouch and Tim Keller. Now, so the way we understand in modern justice, we are often forced to pick in one of the binary system. If you want to push one extreme to all the way down, there's one notion of thought in a sense, it's all libertarianism. You are who you are because of individual choices that you have made. So this justice is all about equality of opportunity. You get to determine your destiny. You are who you are because you have individual choice, equality of opportunity. Such as philosopher Locke and Hume, Immanuel Kant argue more this notion of that justice is more about equality of opportunity. On the other side of this binary thought, if I can push all the way down, rather than saying, hey, this is all about equality of opportunity, it's more about equality of outcome. It's all about what benefits the greatest number of people. So it's more like pragmatic utilitarianism, more in the all the way down the notion is like Marx, German philosopher put more in that. It's the equality of all outcome. And I've seen some modern thinkers also saying, hey, there's actually a third way of thinking about justice. It's called virtue ethics, which originates more from such as Greek philosopher Aristotle and Socrates. The true, hey, it, true justice is neither really isn't about um, equality of opportunity or outcome, but it's all about giving people what they actually deserve. True justice leads to happiness. Such Aristotle, Socrates, Michael Sanders will more fall in this category that society's job is to instill good virtue in each people, and true justice is about giving what they deserve. That's what true justice is all about. Perhaps we all have a notion of that we all have a certain inclination or one or the another, this binary or trinary system. But having said all that, I am neither a politician nor a lawyer. I am neither a sociologist nor a psychologist. But when I look through the scripture about what the Bible says about each of all this spectrum, is that does the Bible say yes to this or this or that? He said yes to all of them. At the same time, says no to all of them. It's much more, it refuses to play the game of putting this binary, binary system, refuses to be on the trinary system, but it's far more complex and far more nuanced. It both affirms and confronts each side. Let's talk about what Bible says about justice. Uh, first of all, does the Bible speak about equal treatment? Absolutely, wholeheartedly. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. The great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Leviticus 19:15. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the rich, to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly because we all are made in the image of God. All are equal standing before God. Proverbs 22, 2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. Well, the one Hebrew word that in the Bible, justice is often married with justice and righteousness and justice and mercy. So I'll deal with all of that. But the word for righteousness in Hebrew is jedeka. That talks a lot about it. It means the, the relationship, right relationship between people. Because we all are made in the image of God. We treat one another with dignity and respect regardless of their status. So it's the equal treatment. Absolutely, the Bible speaks about that. At the same time, does the Bible speak about virtue ethic? Oh, absolutely, too. I uh, Giving people what they deserve, I often even tell non-believers, perhaps there are some of you who are searching for Jesus, you are not quite ready to put trust in Jesus yet. And uh, sometimes I say, yeah, even read book of Proverbs. Even if you end up rejecting Jesus, Proverbs will help you. There are so many truths in that. 
And so much book of Proverbs is filled with virtue ethics. And Micah here, like, justice will be rewarded and the wicked shall be punished. Like here in Micah 3, 1, it says, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? And probably most famous verse in the book of Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. The Hebrew word, and when he talks of justice, is the Hebrew word mishpat. And what does that word mean? It really means that. To giving people their retru retributive justice, the punishing wicked for what they have done. The God and I was watching actually a documentary. I don't know what prompted me. I was watching a documentary of 9-11 yesterday once again and seeing the horror of it. I was like, God, what do you have? Where is true justice in all that? God help us in that. There is that Bible speaks about retributive justice. Mishpat entails the word, giving people what they deserve. Yet at the same time, so absolutely, the word mishpat is also so much more than that. It is also restorative justice against those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, those who are weak. So there is also, the Bible speaks so much about special treatment for those who are weak and marginalized and cannot advocate for themselves. That's what the Hebrew word of the mishpat entails. Like he, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says this, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Psalm 146.9, the Lord watched over the foreigners and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Zechariah 7, 9, and 10, this is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. So the Bible does speak about special care for those who are vulnerable. Uh, we don't tell our food pantry people when they come, hey, equality for all. You have to pay for all this box we are giving you. We don't collect any check from people. We care for those who are in need because that's what God commands us to do. As well as when we sponsor this Afghan family, we don't just say equal treatment, you're, you're in America now, all the best. No, we go out of our ways to help and care for that because that's what justice also entails. In the scripture, justice and mercy are often lumped in together, like act justly and love mercy. And many other cases, when Hebrew word for mercy is this is the last Hebrew word I'll ever give to you today, if I gave you a lot. It's the Hebrew word hesed. And the hesed is, in a sense, unconditional compassion and grace of God. It's the heart attitude. And this heart attitude, hesed, heart attitude, that leads us to do justice, mishpat, to get, treat all people equally, to love and care for them, and to advocate for one another. God's hearts are those for the marginalized and poor as God introduced himself as he's the father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. So we should, therefore, church, do all our best to treat one another equally for we all are made in the image of God. And at the same time, we pray for true justice to prevail. Um, Rachel and Hollander is an advocate for especially those sexual victims um, who's been abused by just gymnast Dr. Larry Nassar. And one of the main things that she often says is justice and forgiveness are not mutually exclusive. The justice and forgiveness can dwell together because true justice involves the retributive justice against the wicked and at the same time the restorative justice for those who have been oppressed and been marginalized. So it includes that as well. And then we stand up for those poor who are marginalized. So do you see the biblical understanding of justice goes all, yes, he said yes to all different notions. At the same time, he says no. And you said, well, that's nothing, Jin. Where are you? All the above. Because Bible it just rise in the tension. Uh, sometimes when you try to resolve all the tension, you fall into heresy. You said, this is all about Bible. Well, what about this and that? This is all about Bible. Well, what about this and that? 
it rise all the above. Having said all that about what the Bible talks about justice, what's happening to these political leaders here in Israel? Which side are they? None of the above. They abandon all aspect of justice. What does Micah say in verse 2? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, he goes on through verse 3 saying, it's a figure of speech describing the cruel and brutal inhumane ways the leaders of Israel treated their people. Complete injustices. It's all about their own gain. And you say, well, Jen, sure, but at least religious leaders did better, right? Ugh, not quite. Read verse 10, 5 and 11. Now, Micah is speaking against the religious leaders of that days. This is what the Lord says, as for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuse to feed them. 11. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet the Lord look for the Lord, and, and they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. One of the loathsome aspects of this religious leader is that they also cooperated with this political leader's injustices. They proclaim peace because it benefits them. It feeds them. It gives them money. Verse 11, in all these religious leaders, what? Her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Oh, I get paid for just giving my lip service. So even these religious leaders enabled this kind of injustices uh, these wicked rulers were doing. God forbid, but what is worse that gets to my gut level is that they cover their injustice with a veneer of spirituality. What does verse 11 say? They say to the Lord, is not the Lord among with us? Nothing bad will happen. No disaster will fall upon us. We are great. We are God's nation. They justified their lies. They only say the good things. They enabled all the injustice in just a nation. half truth while pocketing themselves, all the money and all that. In other words, no one is doing what is right in this time. Now, perhaps you say, oh, church, and I don't have much hope for past, present, future leaders, but I, I have hope for rel religious leaders. They should know better. I pray the same too. I pray that we as a church, you get to nominate leaders. I pray that we will never just wear a veneer of spirituality. Isn't the Lord with us? Everything's great. But we will continue to humble ourselves. And rather than being so advocating my own right, my own power, my own gain, we lay ourselves down and care for one another. If you have the history of taking advantage of by the spiritual leader, it deeply scars you. God forbid that God will protect the testimony of his church. And may we never just say, oh, wow, we are growing. Look at this momentum. God must be pleased with us. Is not the Lord with us? While we can say all that in the behind, the deep down in our heart, our spiritual pride can grow with a veneer of spirituality like these leaders do. We can all extend our own power and extend injustice rather than advocating for one another. Uh, the culture that we live in is just such a self-promotion culture. We are all about, okay, it's my right, my way ought to be done. But when was the last time that you really lay yourself down to care for those one another, church? This book, as much as it is for those leaders of Israel, northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, but this is also for you and me. When was the last time that you really humbled yourself rather than saying, I am always right. When was the last time that you cared for your neighbors, really, those who have been, are in need of your help? Just like as I shared my opening story, Shelton, I confess, I remember so much more injustice that was done to me. I don't remember that many times that I did, but my people around me will tell me, Jin, do you remember how selfish you were always? You looked out for your own. You could have helped me, but you're just all about you. I'm like, I don't remember that. 
I certainly remember when others taken advantage of me, when injustice was extended to me, I couldn't think of any other illustration that I can tell you that I extended injustices. But some of you might say, I don't have any power to extend injustice. I'm not like rulers of Israel. Well, we all have. If you're a mom, you have power and influence. If you're a parent, if you're working, if you have a friend, we all have this godly influence that we can care for one another. But rather than us really remembering how to advocate and care for one another, we are so much about our own gain. Just like last week, we are all about our own greediness because we care about our own rights all the time rather than caring for all people for equal treatment and love and care advocating for one another. So having said all that, I pray that we will humble ourselves. After a sermon, we will have a time of communion. I'll give you some reflection time, reflection time at the time. But think about it, God, how have I failed to care for one another that I'm always eager to talk about my own rights, but how have we failed to care for one another in our lives? I pray that we will think about that. Having said all that, as you see, both political leaders and religious leaders at that time were all about their own gain, thus extending all injustice of those weak and marginalized. Where is hope in that? You might say, oh, the last couple of weeks were depressing. Another depressing song. Ah. Where is hope and justice in all this? We will get to this slowly, surely, from next week, one by one. But let me show you one right voice in the middle of all this dark chapter. Look, verse 8, what prophet Micah speaks. We are the hope for justice, third. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. This is Micah speaking, one positive voice saying, hey, I'll say what needs to be spoken. Micah's resounding message is repent, filled with wickedness. Verse 9, Micah says, hear this, you leaders of Jacob, rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. As a result of their wickedness and injustices, watch the destiny. Verse 12, Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. Where is hope in all this, Shelton? Let me show you where is hope in the Bible for true justice in the, all that. Do you see how Micah is calling out leaders? You are building Zion at the expense of others' blood. You're taking advantage of others through your injustices. You're all about your own gain. But one day, there will be a true man, true just man who will come. 3,000 years later, he will not build Zion upon others' blood. He will build Zion with his own blood. And his name is Jesus, who will be truly just, who will not, while all these both political and religious leaders were all about self-preservation, my gain at the expense of you, Jesus will give himself completely and build Zion upon his blood. The true justice will come when he comes back once again. Yet when he came first time, how did we handle him? We couldn't take this absolute just and righteous man. Man was marked by Mishpat, the justice. Man was marked by the Jedeka, true righteousness. People could not handle him. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Aristotle and Socrates, I have been reading lately the book written by Plato, uh, which is the disciple of Socrates, uh, his book, Republic, lately. Uh, this book is all about, uh, like, often so much is about dealing justice. Socrates, this Plato's mentor, is dialoguing with these Greek pagan philosophers about what true justice is all about. And one of the main philosophers who's dialoguing with Socrates in the book, Republic, is Plato's brother, Glaucon. And he, one of his arguments is saying, it's really not good to be truly just. If you're like perfectly just, it's much more beneficial to just pretend to be just. That will carry you through your life. It's not good for you to be really perfectly just. Then Socrates and all the other philosophers push him. What would happen then if you're like truly just, absolutely perfect? This book is written 380 BC and from philosophers' mouths, they say they will kill him. 
Does that remind you of somebody? What if there's perfectly, truly just man? Humanity will kill him because they cannot handle him. I wonder who they are talking about from their lips. This is what Glaucon says in Republic. It says, though he do no wrong, he must have the repute of the greatest injustice so that he may be put to the test, but let him hold on his course unchangeable even unto death, seeming all his life to be unjust though being just. Such being his disposition, the just man will have to endure the lash, the rack, chains, and finally, after every extremity of suffering, he will be crucified. Who is this perfectly just man from this little mouse or pagan philosopher? Yes, a few thousand years later, truly just man will come. This just man, perfect God and perfect man, while all the others are building Zions upon others' blood, you die, I live. This perfectly just man will build Zion with his own blood, and humanity couldn't handle him. They will impale him, they will crucify him. But because Jesus built at the cross of Jesus Christ, as he shed his blood to redeem us, there is our hope. He has come to inaugurate this glorious kingdom that is marked by true justice, marked by self-donation, not self-preservation. So yes, book of Micah can be a very dark book if you don't see that with the lens of Jesus Christ that one day our true hope and true justice will come to reign. So where is our hope? Hold on, Shelton. When this world is so dark, there are times when our lives, even when I examine my own heart, it's so dark, I don't think about justice for others. I often think of justice for me, me only, because I'm self-centered. But Jesus Christ, our perfectly just man, came and gave all at the cross for our flourishing, for our true justice. He subjected himself to the greatest injustices so that one day may true justice will prevail. So until that day, Shelton, hold on. One day he will come once again and build this glorious Zion. We will talk about it. If you want to know more about it, come next week. But until that day, may we rest at the foot of the cross and may they compel us to truly care and love one another equally, regardless of whatsoever. And we act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. That is the very message that Micah is calling all of us. So at this time, as we transition our time in communion, I want you to think about each other in silence, prayer, how have you been so self-absorbed in your own needs only that you fail to look out for those who are around you? We only remember injustice that was done to us rather than thinking about how we can influence positively to care for those who are around us who are weak and vulnerable. I want you to think about that as you reflect. And as you reflect in silence, how does the life, death, and the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus Christ compel you to act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with our God? What does that look like for you? Let's meditate in silence for a few minutes, and then I'll preside over the table of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Oh God, as we come to your table, we repent. God, it's relatively easy to talk about all the wrongs of political leaders and the religious leaders of that days. And we just put fingers, put our fingers against them. Oh yeah, they didn't know better. But as I reflect my own life, oh God, I confess. I have been so absorbed over my own rights and my own privilege. And God, I pray that we will humble ourselves and reveal us, show us what it means to truly act justly and love mercy. And God, I thank you for many of us in our congregation who do that so well in their sphere of influence. 
So I thank you. While we thank you, we also examine our hearts and mind. We pray that you continue to humble us and truly live out the calling. What does the Lord require of us? I pray that we will live that out well. In your name we pray. Amen. In a moment, we will partake this communion together. If you Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Lord, we ask you to partake with us. If you don't know the one who shed his own blood to build his giant, we ask you to more than partaking in this communion, we ask you to consider him first and foremost. There maybe you have been really wanting, where is the true justice and righteousness to reign? There is that one day coming because of what Jesus Christ has done. I ask that you consider that today. Now, let's peel the top layer so that we can take out the bread and we will partake together just in a moment. <sighs> On a night when our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. This is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And let's peel the second layer for the cup. And after the bread, he also took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Oh Lord, you said every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. But as we do, we also remember your sacrifice on the cross for the love. You subjected yourself to the greatest injustice. You built Zion with your own blood, not our blood, so that one day we may experience true justice without ever trace of injustice. So God, we remember you. We thank you for your sacrifice. In Christ, we hope. In Christ, we live. And in Christ, we remember your love that poured out at the cross. So God, I pray that you cause us to repent, cause us to humble ourselves, and cause us to be courageous to love well in all our spheres of influence. May your true justice reign. And I pray that we will be the church that never just wear a veneer of spirituality that says, it's not the Lord with us. Nothing bad will happen. But we will continue to humble ourselves and care for one another as you have called us to do. God, this is a lofty calling that we cannot do with our own might and strength. So we look to you for help. We sit at the foot of the cross. Our greatest, our love, our God subjected himself to humility so that one day, one day when you come in glory, we can worship you freely with joy. Until that day, hold us, hold us and sustain us. In your precious name we pray, amen.